So a couple of weeks ago, I made a video running through all my various different canopy dislikes, and one of the main ones was not having an accurate way to monitor my battery. I mentioned that there was a few different monitors I had my eye on, but a lot of you guys commented with different suggestions on ones I hadn't thought about, so massive shout out to everyone who commented, that was much appreciated. One of the ones I found was showing up a lot in that comment section was this Victron 500 amp smart shunt. This is a Bluetooth only battery monitor, which means there is nothing else to install aside from this one piece. Now for me, Bluetooth was really important because it's going to allow me to actually view all that battery data on my phone, record the screen to share with you guys in videos just like these. Now I didn't actually realize you could get these in Bluetooth only, I thought they always came with a uh, little external monitor screen, so this is actually perfect for me and massive shout out to everyone who actually recommended this model, you've essentially saved me well over $100. That was compared to the version I was going to buy. If you're interested, this particular one cost me $192.50. I'm pretty sure that was, the, that was the price. And I reckon for all the features you get with these things, that's a pretty decent price, provided it works well, but we'll find that out soon enough. And considering there is no external display, the installation should literally take about five minutes, which will run through shortly. But first, let's take a closer look at this device. If you're not familiar with how these shunt style battery monitors work, essentially all you have to do to install this is take everything off the negative post of our auxiliary battery, including our DC-DC charger, and install it on this side of the shunt instead, the uh, system minus side. Then we take ourselves a new cable similar to this one, a nice thick cable that I prepared earlier. This then becomes the only thing connected to the negative post of that auxiliary battery. And then the other end, you guessed it, goes to the battery minus side of that shunt. And that means that no power can get in or out of the battery without passing through this shunt. And that allows us to monitor all the flow of power going between these two terminals, so we can keep an eye on how much power we're using around camp, as well as how much power is going back into the battery while we're charging. This is the 500 amp model, so a lot of current can flow through this thing, honestly way more than I'll ever need, but it's always better to go overkill with stuff like this. This model can also monitor the voltage of your starter battery, and it does come with the proper fused uh, wiring to do that as well, although you might need to extend it depending on the location of your starter battery. Anyway, let's go get this thing installed. Okay, so first step is just going to be to disconnect everything off the negative post of that auxiliary battery, which is just in here. We can see currently connected to that negative post is both my DC-DC charger and all my accessories. So just take my 13mm socket and disconnect both of those. Now, normally the next step would be to find somewhere convenient to mount this right near your battery before we get started on the wiring. However, for my setup, I'm planning on dramatically changing this area in the next couple of weeks, so it doesn't make sense to mount this too permanently for me. Uh, so just for the short term, I'm gonna be taking some double-sided tape, and I'm just gonna stick this down on top of my battery. So I've just run into a bit of a snag. It turns out the, uh, the terminals on the end of my negative wires, while they're the perfect size for the battery, they're a little bit too small for the negative post on the shunt. So the unexpected next step for me is gonna to be to lop both of these off and replace them with larger ones. Well, no DIY project would be complete without at least one setback, but I've now locked both those undersized ring terminals off, and I've put the wiring from both of these into one single ring terminal of a suitable size. So that fits really nicely over those posts for the shunt, which is great. I suppose ideally I would have run both the feed for the DC-DC charger and my accessories to separate ring terminals for neatness. Um, but when I'm doing, when I redo all this wiring in the next couple of weeks, I'm planning on running a new and thicker feed from the DC-DC charger. So at that time, I'll probably run both those onto their own separate lugs. But for now, that is perfectly fine. And the next step for me is going to be to mount this shunt probably in the middle of the battery there. So there's plenty of easy access for the wiring. You'll also notice I've covered all my wiring in this uh, cloth tape. I just find it gives it a really nice neat look, it gives it an extra layer of protection and it also stops it from uh, making any like rattling noises. Not that that's an issue in the canopy but it's just good for making the project look a little bit neater. Alrighty, got my shunt stuck to the top of the battery and the next step is just going to be to connect this earth feed from my DC-DC charger and all my accessories to the system minus side of this smart shunt. 
Next step is to connect our brand new earth cable between the battery minus side of the shunt and the negative post on our battery. What thickness wiring you should use for your setup is just going to be dependent on what you're drawing from this side of the shunt to run your fridge, inverters, any travel ovens and all those accessories that you're drawing power from your battery through. So for me, I'm not really running anything too crazy, so I'm just using this 25 square millimeter cable and that will get the job done for the short term, but when I do my change around, I'm going to be swapping this out for zero BNS cable to give me plenty of power at this end for running things like inverters. But for now, this 25 square millimeter will get the job done. So just bolt that into the battery minus side of that shunt. You want this nice and tight so it gets a good solid connection. So both earth cables are now connected to that shunt and I know they're working because my lights in the canopy now turn on, which is good. It means that power is actually traveling through that shunt. However, it's not gonna be giving us any data because there's no positive feed. So the next step is gonna be to take one of the two included positive cables. At one end, you'll see this little push in terminal, super handy, which you just shove that into the relevant slot on the front of that shunt and away you go. And on the other end is a standard ring terminal for connecting to the positive post on the battery. It's also appropriately fused as well, so you can be confident knowing everything is protected. So all you need to do is poke that into the VBAT positive socket like so. It will click into place and that won't be coming out soon, which is great. If you do need to get this back out again, you'll see there's an orange section down below. All you have to do is kind of press that in with something small like a screwdriver and that will release that like so but we'll plug that in for the install. I'm just gonna tuck the excess wiring down the side of my battery box like this to make it look a bit neater. And then other side, pretty self-explanatory, standard ring terminal, that's gonna go on the positive post of our battery. There we go, told you it was gonna be a five minute install, job done. As soon as I connected that positive feed to the battery, the blue little Bluetooth light on the bottom of that smart shunt started flashing, letting me know it's got power and it's ready to connect. So the next step for me is to download the Victron Connect app on my phone. So I've just loaded the app and I can see that it's already found that smart shunt up the top there. So I'm gonna press on that one to connect. When I ask you for a pin code, just enter six zeros. Like anything of the modern age, it needs an update immediately, so we're going to go ahead and install that update. So the first thing we have to do is give that battery monitor some more information about the battery we've just connected it to. So on the top right, you'll find a settings icon. We'll give that a click, and then here we'll see battery capacity. Hit set on that and type in your battery capacity. So mine's a 120 amp hour lithium. So I'm going to type in 120 and press enter. If you're using the auxiliary input for either a temperature monitor or to connect to another battery, you can hit set next to that option there and tell it what you've connected it to. Uh, obviously I haven't done that, so I'll leave it on none. Then it's going to open up some more advanced settings. So now we're going to jump into battery and the things we need to worry about here are that we've set that battery capacity correctly. So for mine, that's 120 amp hours, that's spot on. Uh, charge voltage for a 12 volt system like this one, 13.2 is correct. Discharge floor, that's set to 50% by default, which is great for an AGM battery. However, this is lithium. So depending on how efficient your lithium battery is, mine is about, this particular model is, you can use about 85% of its charge. So I'm gonna set that to 15% because that's my discharge floor. Uh, I'm gonna make sure the Pukert exponent is 1.05 for lithium batteries, 1.05 and charge efficiency factor for lithium is 99%. If you have a different battery, you might need to look up some different settings for one that's suitable for you. I know my battery is fully charged right now, so I can leave the state of charge at 100%. However, if yours is halfway full, you can change that setting to 50%, for example, and that way you'll get accurate data straight away. So now that it's all set up, I should be able to exit out of these settings and we'll see if it's working. There we go, state of charge, 100%. Let's flick some lights on and see what happens. Wow, that's actually pretty instant. So I can see as soon as I flick those two light strips on, my current draw is now two amps or uh, 1.98 amps, drawing 26 watts of power. What else have we got? Consumed amp hours, so how much charge you've actually used, and also the time remaining. That is gonna be so valuable. Now, I think it's gonna take a while to become accurate. See, that's clocking down pretty quickly. We're down to five days now. Okay, so it's starting to settle down around near the three-day mark, which seems pretty accurate to me. 
I reckon I'm going to go turn my fridge on, crank some lights up on the other side, plug some stuff into the chargers and uh, see what these numbers do. Alrighty, so I've now cranked my fridge up, turned all my lights on and also plugged a bunch of stuff into those charging sockets. It's had quite a dramatic effect on my power consumption. I'm now drawing close to 10 amps of power, or 9.57 to be precise, 126 watts, and I've also consumed 1.1 amp hours since turning all that stuff on. So it's also telling me my battery's gonna last me 10 hours and 18 minutes drawing the current load of power. Keep in mind that that's with the fridge running flat out, but once it gets down to temperature, that should start cycling on and off, which will uh, prolong my runtime. So it's a brand new day and the next thing I wanted to try out is a bit of a proximity test or how far we can use the app away from the main unit. I've heard online that the range isn't very good in these systems so I thought it was worth checking it out. Obviously right now I am directly next to the unit so the connection is nice and strong. But I'll just back out into the uh, overview page where we can see that signal strength and start walking away from the car. So first test I'm going to do is about 5 metres away which is just about about here, five metres away from the unit. Keep in mind the canopy is in between me and the unit as well, so that might be affecting things. So right now you can see we've got about four, three to four bars of signal strength, so it's already dropping off, but we'll make sure we can connect. 20, 40, 60, 80, and fetching data, we're in. So from here, still works perfectly fine. That was a pretty quick connection, so no problems at all. And at least that means I'm gonna be able to check my battery from all the way around the canopy, up in the tent, or also in the cab of the car, which is great. We'll keep going, see how that signal strength uh, remains or doesn't. Go back into the overview page. So right now, actually I'll go about here. This is about the seven meter mark at the moment. The signal strength has dropped down to two to three bars fluctuating. I'll see if we can connect. 20, 40, yeah, we're still getting there. 60, 80, it's definitely slower, but we're still connecting, fetching data and we're in from about the oh, seven to eight meters, somewhere in that range. That's pretty good, about a car length away from the sensor or a bit extra. Go back to the overview, keep walking, see how far we can go. Alrighty, so signal strength is, oh, it's fluctuating all over the place. Now and then it says we've got four bars, then down to two. See if we can connect. 20, 40, 60, okay. Yeah, we're still getting there, a bit slower, but we're still connecting. 95. Or can I do it? Yes, we're in, okay. So this is probably close to the 10 meter mark, I would say, and we're still connecting, which is good. It definitely takes longer and it's probably a bit more inconsistent. I have tested it from here just before and it was uh, struggling, but that time it worked. So we'll jump back into the main overview page. Come about here, so I don't know, 12 to 15 meters, down to two bars of signal on the screen there. Click in. I suppose it's going to depend on where you're holding this as well. So I'll try and keep it at this same level. I think that's where I've been holding it the whole way along. But if I held it in the air, it'd probably have a better chance of connecting. Or I don't think it's going to work now. It's going between 20, then back to 1%, 20, then back to 1% again. There we go. Unable to connect messages just appeared on my phone. For me, that's okay. As long as I can check that battery from either right next to the canopy, up in the tent, or in the cab of the car, that's good enough for me. So I've just turned the car on to see what it looks like when the battery is charging and I can see straight away there's a lot of amps going back into that battery. At the top of the page here we've also got two more tabs. We have a history tab and that's going to give us some retrospective data on our power consumption. Things like the deepest discharge, average discharge, last discharge and a whole bunch more numbers. We can also jump across to the trends tab to see a bunch of different timelines on our power consumption over time. So you can plot things like the state of charge, the auxiliary input if you're using that extra socket, the voltage, your current draw, power draw, and also the consumed amp hours. It's just a great way of seeing exactly how your batch has been performing over time. Well guys, that was just a quick install of that Victron 500 amp smart shunt battery monitoring system. Pretty cool bit of kit. I'm looking forward to getting some proper use out of it and also providing you guys with some more detailed metrics on the things we check out on this channel. Thank you so much for watching this video. As I mentioned, there's a lot of 
uh, a lot of changes on the way for my 12 volt setup, including moving that battery, adding some thicker cabling, redoing all those pesky lights that keep falling off, and also adding an inverter for a few reasons, which we'll touch on at that point in time. So stay tuned for those episodes coming out shortly. Leave any questions you have in the comment section down below about that battery monitor, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.